Good morning and welcome to the Bridge of Hope. We hope you had an incredible Thanksgiving. My name is Sarah and these are your weekly announcements. If this is your first time with us this morning, here at the Bridge we want you to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. If you haven't already, be sure to fill out a Connect card. You can find these in the back of the seat in front of you. Once you fill these out, take them to the giving station and drop them in the slot. Once again, we're so thankful for having you with us this morning. Calling all junior high, your youth group's going to be one week early this month, on December 13th, for a special Christmas party. So bring a friend and we'll see you there. Don't forget, Christmas at the Bridge will be December 20th at 6 p.m. this year. This is an event for the whole family. There's going to be skits, songs, cookies, and hot cider. You're not going to want to miss out. That's Sunday, December 20th. We will see you there. Well, that's it for your weekly announcements. If you need any additional information, check out our Facebook page or thebridge129.org. Thank you for being with us this morning. Now let's get ready to worship. We just need more this morning. We need more of you, Jesus. Oh, the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't be there. You got to believe that this morning. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Yes, he does. Oh, and my God will never fail. We believe that. Yes, my God will never fail. We believe that He's never failing. He is good in all His ways. Although the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. No, it won't. Does the God I serve knows only how to try on? Oh, my God will never fail. No, he won't. Oh, my God will never fail. Sing with me, come on. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. To you, Lord. Do you believe that this morning? That there's power in his name? There is power in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Come on, let's sing that and agree this morning. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Yes, sir. If he war he wages, he will win. Oh, yes. I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how this story ends. I know, I know how this story ends. Come on. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle. sing it again. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle It 
belongs to Jesus Belongs to you, Father This battle's not mine This battle's yours Cause you take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good Come on, let's get that in our spirit this morning Sing that with me You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good Oh, you do, Father you take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good One more time, come on You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Yes, you turn it for good Come on, let's sing and I'm gonna see a victory. Come on. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Come on with your heart. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the It belongs to the Lord. Just give him glory this morning. We believe that this morning. Come on, let's sing about the name of Jesus this morning. I want every voice to sing this morning. And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. A child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Yes. Oh, doesn't it feel good to sing about the name of Jesus this morning? I want to do that first verse again this morning, and I want you to sing it with me this morning. Come on, let's sing. Come on. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all, yes. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Oh, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Wash me white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Who can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Sing out Oh, Jesus paid it all All to my sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Let's sing it again. Oh, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Oh, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed did white as snow. If you believe that this morning, give him glory in his house. 
Oh, there's nowhere else we can turn but to our Lord, our Savior, our Jesus. Jesus, we praise your precious name this morning. And when before the throne, come on, I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Come on, I'm going to sing that again this morning. Let's sing that again this morning. Come on. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Come on. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe it all. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Again, come on. Oh, Jesus. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. My sin, my sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Give him glory this morning in his house. Give him glory for who he is. Because he paid the price. All the price is paid. Come on. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one. church. Sing with me. Oh, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Oh, sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. One more time, come on. Oh, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe, I owe it all. My sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Praise my sin, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My sin Thank you, Jesus. had left a crimson stain. He washed Thank you, Jesus. it white as snow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, we give you praise in your house this morning. Thank you for shedding your blood, for seeking us out, those who were lost, undone, without hope. Jesus, you sought us out, and for that, we're grateful this morning. We give you praise in your house. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to gather one more time with like-minded believers, full of the Spirit of God, full of the presence of God, being able to just lift your name today. What a joy it is, Lord God, to be able to do it. We thank you. We thank you for your presence that's here this morning. Father, we know that there are many needs throughout the sanctuary, those that are watching online, whether it be 
physical need, whether it be a spiritual need, an emotional, mental situation. God, we know today that you are the Lord God that provides, that heals, that gives direction. Lord, when we lack wisdom, you said we can ask and we will be given liberally. Whatever it is today that we have need of, Lord, you have it. You provide it. All that we need for life and godliness is found in you. And so this morning, we pray. We pray that your perfect will would be done in our lives. We pray for those that are sick in body this morning, that you would touch them and heal them. That you would touch those, Lord, whether it be cancer, whether it be coronavirus, whether it be diabetes, whatever it may be that they're dealing with from a physical standpoint, that you would touch their bodies and you would heal them. We pray for those this morning that are dealing with sin sickness today, Lord, which is an even far greater disease. They're bound, they're, they're in chains of bondage that Jesus, you came to set us free from. We pray for those today, those in our family, those in our community that are bound by sin. We ask you to set captives free. We pray that you would save those that are lost in our homes, in our families, in our community. We pray that multitudes would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Today, Lord, for those that just have specific needs, whatever they may be, Lord, you know what they are. We, we join in agreement together that your will, your way is perfect. God, hear the prayer that is being prayed from this place. And for those that will be watching online, that are, there's just a cry in their heart. They, they need something from God. Your word says that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, seeking help in the time of need. And today, Lord, we need help. God, we need help as a nation. We need help as a people. Our society is crumbling right before our eyes, and we need your help. We don't have the answers. We don't have the solutions. We don't know which way to go. We only know to call upon your name today. But we trust that as we do, Lord God, you will intervene. You will bow the heavens. You'll bow down as it is the heavens, and you will step in to the earth, and you will move in a profound and powerful way. And the enemies of God will be scattered. And that's our prayer this morning. Let your perfect and powerful agenda and will and mandate go forth. We know nothing's going to stop it. May the gates of hell not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ and the people of God today. May we rise up, Lord, in what you've called us to do and what you've called us to be. Help us to walk in the love and the mercy and the grace that you've shown us. Help us to reveal it and show it to those around us. Wake the church of Jesus Christ up today, we pray. Give us courage now. Cause faith to rise in our hearts. Cause our faith to grow. Cause our trust in you to grow. Oh, Holy Spirit, turn our eyes on Christ and his word today like never before. Revive us, oh God. Revive us, we ask. Oh, Lord, we ask all of these things today, including every personal need, every request. We ask these all in your name. Let your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. And everyone said... Amen. Praise God. Give God praise before you sit down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm excited to be in the house of the Lord. Amen, aren't you? Amen. It's good to be here today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Thessalonians. If you, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll get there. If you were not able, if you're not um, on social media or maybe you weren't able to get online, um, as you can tell, we just, we have kind of brought back some things that we started in the, in the spring of the year just because we know there's a spike in uh, corona uh, virus cases that are going on in Ripley County. And so, um, you know, what we're trying to do, as we've said from this pulpit a number of times, is just use a common sense approach and letting you know we are aware, we see what's going on. Um, we don't believe that there's any need right now to shut services down. Thank God for that. Um, but we do feel like it's important to stay socially distant and, and do those things that uh, mitigate the spread, right? And so, again, you can find those things on our website, just some of the changes. Uh, one of the big changes is the doors will not open, uh, uh, of the, the church doors will not open until 20 minutes before service. And so what we're trying to do is just mitigate the coming together and uh, congregating, having coffee, which are all the things that we love to do. Um, hopefully those things will get, we'll, we're bringing those things back very, very shortly, hopefully. Um, but, but that's probably what you need to know most. The doors will not open until 20 minutes before service, and then all of our common areas are shut down for now. Um, we're, our plan was, as, we, as the elders and the staff, and we just kind of met and prayed and thought about this, we thought, we'll do that until the, the county itself goes to a, I don't know, there's this color code thing, right? It's red and blue and yellow. I don't know what it is, but whatever the next one down is, 
right? When we just drop down to the next category, then we'll lift that stuff and go back to regular. So we just think it's important. We have a lot of folks in the church who have, who have dealt with, uh, with the virus. Thankfully, praise God, no serious cases that I'm aware of. And so we just thank God for that. Um, listen, for those of you that are, are, we've heard it all over and over. If, if you are uh, uh, someone that is uh, the elderly group, more, more advanced in age, um, if you have an underlying condition, we just, just use wisdom, man, like especially. I think it's important for all of us to take care of ourselves, but especially for those of you that, that may be in those positions, take it serious. It's not, uh, I, I, we're certainly not of those that believe this is all a hoax, right? Come on, please tell me that's not you. If it is, we'll just, whatever, it's, that's your choice. But it's a serious sickness, right? Um, but, but it's okay. It's not the end of the world either. We can, we're going to get through it. Do you believe that? Amen. Yeah, come on. Give God praise. That's all right. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I have a word for you this morning. I'm excited. I'm telling you I have a word, and I pray that you will see it, and you will receive it in the same way that I feel like the Holy Spirit has deposited into my heart. We've got a lot to read, so let's get started. It's entitled Standard Bearers. Simply put, Standard Bearers. First Thessalonians. We're going to be reading a lot, so follow along. In fact, we're going to read uh, the majority of this chapter. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as it is from us as though the day of Christ had come. Now, it appears that the Thessalonian Christians had started to become anxious. They, there was a rumor going around as it is that Jesus had already returned. And how many of you know that if you're a Christian... And you've heard that Jesus has already returned. That's not a good feeling, right? And so Paul's reassuring them, and he's saying, just relax. He hasn't returned yet. And and in fact, I'm just going to give you some information, right, to prepare you and what it is that you should be looking for. He said, let no one deceive you by any means for that day. That day is in capital. That means the return of Christ is what he's referring to. Will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining and that, you may, and that, he, or, and that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, And hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by epistle. Now, some of what we just read is no doubt difficult to understand. And in fact, if you study a little bit, you'll find that this second chapter of Thessalonians, there's quite a bit of debate among the Christian community. That's reality. And so today, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not trying to come and just give you what I think is the exact interpretation and meaning of what Paul's saying. Um, in fact, some of the greatest debate is about what I'm going to be speaking about this morning. And so what I want to do is I want to just use this as a beginning point and then show you what I think Paul is speaking about using other passages of Scripture as well. But some of the biggest debate of this chapter is what is the restrainer? What is Paul talking about? Now, the people were worried. They, they were afraid. They were concerned about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Paul says, you don't have to worry. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't taken place. And then he begins to say, These are some, there are some things that need to take place before, before, before Jesus Christ is going to return. And he says, one of them is this, this man of perdition, the man of sin, the Antichrist, the beast. There, there's going to be an uprising. Now, you and I have probably heard some teaching about this in some form or another, and it's a difficult thing to understand. 
And so I don't want to spend a lot of time there, but Paul says that this is going to happen. There's going to be someone who rises up in, on the world stage and basically declares himself to be as God. And they're going to be empowered as it is, according to Scripture, with an ability from Satan himself to, to perform signs and wonders and miracles. That's why, as charismatic Christians, even though we believe in the supernatural, and we do, we believe in signs, we believe in wonders, we believe in the supernatural power of God, but that is not where all of our hope is. Because there's coming a day where Satan is going to perform the very same miracles. And so don't, don't get hooked up by the next fad within the Christian community just because you see some miracles taking place. That's good, and we thank God for those. But there's coming a day where even the very agent of Satan himself is going to perform miracles, right? And, and those who have not been rooted and grounded in the word of God, they're going to be deceived because, because they're going to have a gullible mind. They're going to, have, they're going to be seen only with their sensory uh, eye as it is. They're going to be seen only with feelings. They're going to say, wow, look at this man. Look at, look at what abilities he has. Look, look at how he has the ability to to bring down signs and wonders. Maybe he heals the sick, maybe whatever it is. And, and, and there's going to be a deception that begins to take place. And the only way for you and I to guard against such deception is to be rooted and grounded in God's word. You're not going to be able to distinguish it on your own, with your own ability and with your own eyes. Paul's very clear about that. He says, so you've got to stay steadfast. That's why he says in the 15th verse, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught. In other words, hold fast to the word of God. And folks, as we are seeing now a delusion and a deception that is sweeping over our land, I cannot tell you enough from this pulpit as your pastor. You need to know the word of God. You need to study the Word of God. You need to read the Bible. You need to listen to the Bible on audio. Watch it, listen to it, however you can get it in your heart, your mind, and your spirit. Because there is a clear delusion that's taking place now. And, and Paul says these things are going to take place. And, but, but he refers to something that's of debate. And he says there's a restrainer now that's holding this back. And, and there's a lot of debate as to what the restrainer is. And he, he alludes to the fact that there is something or actually someone that is holding back evil from just totally having its way. Do you see that? He says, I told you this. And apparently Paul taught them this when he was there at Thessalonica. And he, he said, I, I told you about this. And he said, there's a restrainer that's holding back evil. And, that, and that's what I want to talk about today, this, this restrainer. I believe today that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. If you're taking notes, you can write it down. I believe that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, and even more specifically, the Holy Spirit within the believer or the church of Jesus Christ. And, and there, is, there is a lot of thought, a lot of theory, and that's what it is, that, that basically says until the church is raptured out of the earth, evil is going to be restrained. We, I don't know if that's exactly true, but I believe it is. And I want to I try to give you some other passages to prove what I'm saying. What we do know, what, we're, what we are certain of is that Paul tells us very clearly that as the return of Christ gets closer and closer, lawlessness is going to increase. That's not up to debate. That's very clearly understood. And folks, we're watching that take place in our day. Would you agree? Come on, if you're not seeing that, then there's something spiritually wrong. I'm telling you, I, there's something wrong if you're not seeing that right now in society, not just our society, but in society as, as a whole, lawlessness is increasing. And because of this increase of lawlessness, the role of the restrainer is going to become more and more imperative. And I, I, I want you to say that because here's, here's the reality. Evil is greedy. Lawlessness is greedy. There's, there's never an end to what lawlessness will not try to overtake. In other words, the more you give in to lawlessness, the more you give in to evil, the more it's going to take and the more it's going to continue. Evil doesn't ever just decide to subside. Satan does not just sit back and say, oh, you know what? We've taken enough ground. We've destroyed enough families. We've, 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 we've split enough marriages. We've brought enough sickness. We've, we've destroyed enough people. We've killed. We've stealed. We've destroyed enough. And so now we're just going to take a reprieve. Satan never takes a reprieve. There's never an end to what lawlessness will attempt to do. Would you agree? And, and so clearly there's a, there's a restraining force on the earth. You, you, you can't sit here today and tell me that you honestly believe that somehow Satan just sits back, he gets tired, he takes a vacation, he thinks, oh, I've done enough. No, there, there's a force that's stopping him. There's something on the earth, and that's what Paul's talking about. There's something on the earth that is, that is just 
even though you and I are watching it increase, even though we're watching things go around us that, that, that just stuns our own senses, like we can't believe what we're seeing, yet today you must understand there is a restrainer. There's a restraining force in the earth. As born-again believers, you and I have become new creations. That's what the scripture teaches. It's very clear. You're a new person. When you come to Christ, you are given a new spirit, a new heart, a new mind. All of it dwells within you. You're not given a new mind. The new mind comes as you study the word, as you renew the word, as you, as you begin to learn more and more about God. But you have a new spirit and a new heart. Amen? And as such, as such a people, that's who we are. The Bible refers to us as new creations. We become part of this force on the earth that restrains evil and lawlessness. This lawlessness would literally, if, if left unchecked, would literally destroy our societies. It would destroy our homes, our marriages, and our children. The, the best example that we see of this is the Bible speaks of a seven-year period, and it's referred to as the Great Tribulation. And, and Jesus, referencing this period, says, look, there's never been a time like it in the history of man, and there'll never be a time like it again. And, and so that gives you, an, I mean, think of, think of the history of humanity, and think of some of the, the vile evil that has, that has spread across human history. And yet Jesus is saying this seven-year period is going to be so evil. There, and why? Do you know why? Because Satan is going to be unleashed. That's what we learn in the book of Revelation. Satan is given a seven-year period where there's no more restraining force. There's nothing holding him back any longer. And the Bible speaks of, of blood that comes up to the bridle of a horse because of death and war and destruction. You talk about pestilence. You talk about, you talk about disease and, 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 and fear and all of these. And, and you can debate what that's going to happen, when it's going to happen, all you want. But we know it's going to happen. The seven-year tribulation period is nothing more than seven years where there's no longer a restrainer on the earth. Evil is left to just go and do as it chooses. Now, I, I believe that the church of Jesus Christ is going to be raptured during that period. That's my belief. You can have yours. You can choose. There's, there's some other thoughts in Scripture that are there. It's not completely and totally clear. I think it's fairly clear. But I think it's this seven-year period when the church has been raptured that Satan himself is going to be leashed because there's no longer a voice. There, there's no longer a people that are willing to stand up and say, wait a minute, this is wrong. We, we will not bow to this. We will not yield to this. This is not good for our children. This is not good for our families. This is not productive for our society. You see, that voice will be gone. And when that voice is gone, folks, you can bet, you can bet, you know that hell is going to be unleashed on the earth. But you and I become that voice today. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become the voice that God himself can speak through. That's what he's chosen to do. God himself has chosen to have a people on the earth that he can speak through. We become the life, as it is, where Christ can be manifest. How, how does Jesus manifest himself on the earth today? Through the church of Jesus Christ. That's how he chooses to manifest himself. How, how does God speak today? He speaks clearly through his word. That's, that, that is first and foremost. But he speaks through the people of God. Have you ever heard the phrase that you may be the only Bible that someone ever reads? And, and so God speaks through the church. He speaks through the word of God flowing through the people of God. And, and we become that voice when we are born again, true followers of Jesus Christ. We have been called today to push back darkness and bring the light and life of Christ to every situation that we find ourselves in. We, we are the voice in the room that has reason, that has morality, that understands there is still a right and there is still a wrong. There is a way that seems right in the eyes of God, but we are in the eyes of man, but we understand that it is sin in the eyes of God. And we are the voice that rise in the midst of our circumstance and our situation, and we declare that to be so. We're not afraid. We're not cowering back, worried what other people might think, because we know what God thinks, and we're more concerned about what God thinks than we are what man says. Somebody give God praise in his house. In every situation that we come into, we bring the life and light of Christ. We, we, we bring the opinion of God. We're not called to bring our own opinion to the situation, folks. We're not called to bring our own ideas, our own theories. We're not, we're not called to adopt our, our own conspiracies. 
We are called to bring the life and light of Christ into every situation. We're called to know this book and bring it into every circumstance. And so when you're asked about marriage, bring God's idea of marriage. When you're asked about family, bring God's idea of family. When you're asked about sin, bring God's idea of sin. Don't give your own idea and your own thought. You and I are called to share the word of God. And in so doing, we become a restrainer. We we become a force against that which is evil. And unfortunately, now we're watching. And and, and, in some strange way, we're watching the courage of the church just, just dissipate. Like we're afraid. We're just scared to death to say anything. But I'm telling you that if you're afraid to speak, you are allowing evil to go forward. That's what you're doing. Your fear is allowing evil to continue to penetrate society. When all the while you've been called to be a restrainer against evil. Now, I believe that in the Old Testament there's a story that reveals this in a powerful way. If you remember last week, I like, I like stories. I, it helps me. It helps me to understand theological concepts. And so I want you to turn to the book of Esther. Many of you know the story, and it's a profound story. We're not able to read it all today, but if you have a chance this week, read it. Read it in light of what you're hearing preached this morning, and tell me if you don't think what I'm sharing with you is real. I I want you to see that the story of Esther is a story about how evil was restrained, how God used his people, his children, his called ones as it is, to restrain evil and ultimately from protecting his people, his total people, from being ruined or perish, perishing. Now, it happens during a time of a king by the name of Ahasuerus. And if I say the words wrong, just forgive me. He was a Persian king who was a ruler over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. So he was a powerful man. He was a mighty king. And the Bible says that one day while he's in the middle of a feast, this king, he's, he's having a feast, he's feeling good. The Bible doesn't say it, but I'm assuming he's, you know, half, half tipsy. A little drunk, and he, call, he decides to bring his wife, the queen, into the court. And he calls for her, and he has his, his court's people, they go, and they say, hey, the king's calling for you. But for whatever reason, she decides that she's not going to go. She refuses. And this was a great sign of disrespect. Do you understand? And, and so, of course, the king is angry, and he strips her of her royal position as queen. His, it's, a really, it's really not funny. I shouldn't say it's funny. I'm going to get in trouble if I say this. I think it's funny. Some of the ladies may not think it's funny. But, but the, the, the inner court of, of King Ahasuerus, he's, he says some real dumb advisors. And they're like, oh, well, you got to take care of this because now our wives are going to disrespect us and they're not going to honor us the way they should. And, and so he falls under the pressure and he basically strips the queen, right? You know the story. And so that opens the door, right, for a new queen to be crowned. And so what we have right in scripture is the very first episode of The Bachelor. (laughs) It's right here. It's right in scripture. I mean, I don't watch that foolishness, but I I know enough about it. It's exactly what's happening. You know the story. And and so the, the guys that are advising the king, they come up with this idea and they say, look, let's bring the most beautiful women, the most accomplished women in our in our province, let's bring them before the king and and you choose the one you want. Isn't that what they're doing on TV now? I mean, Hollywood thinks they're so creative. I mean, come on, like this this was thought of thousands of years ago. And, And so, long story short, Esther is an orphan. You know the story, she's a Jew, but she's an orphan. And she's being raised by her cousin, Mordecai. And, and for whatever, however it happens, Esther finds herself in this, in this bachelor episode looking for a rose, and, and she's there. And the next thing you know, she is chosen, right? She's the one chosen. She's, she's given the whatever, and she's picked. But folks, it wasn't by chance that she was picked. It wasn't luck. There is no luck in the kingdom of God. There is no luck for you and I who call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ. I don't live by luck. I don't live by chance. I live by the leading and direction of the Holy Spirit of God. We don't live by chance. It's not just happenstance. Oh, it just worked out that way. No, it was by God's grace, God's mercy, and God's providence that he puts Esther in a position that he knew he needed her to be at this particular time. 
Because there's going to be an evil man that rises up. And this man is named Haman. And, and Haman is the picture of evil. He, he's a greedy, evil man. You see, he's, he rises into this position of authority and power to the king. The king he's like second in command to the king. And, and quite frankly, he has everything he could ever want. But the reality is, like we said at the beginning, evil never stops. The evil is never satisfied. You've got to understand this, folks. I hope you see it. I hope you recognize that in the world we're living today, evil is never satisfied. And so as you begin to engage in conversations with people who do not believe the word of God and who do not follow the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe that your compromising is going to somehow win them to Christ, you have been fooled and you have been deceived. Because evil never subsides. It never quits. And, and so what happens is Haman is walking and there's a decree that's made that everybody that sees Haman should bow and pay homage and bend their knee to him. But Mordecai, Esther's cousin, refuses because he's a Jew. And a good Jew knows you do not bow to anyone but God. And so Mordecai is enraged and he, he creates this plan that he's going to not only destroy Mordecai, but of course he's going to destroy the Jews as well. Mordecai finds out the plan and he appeals to Esther. Look at Esther chapter 3. That's where we'll just read just a few verses. Esther chapter 3 starting at verse 8. Now he knows the plan. Mordecai knows about it and so he's appealing. He can't get in to see the queen but he's, he's appealing to her and this is what he says. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction which was given at Shushan that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hatrath returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke and gave him a command for all the servants, all the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called... <clears throat> He has but one law, and that's to put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called for these many 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther words, and, Ed and Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Morde Mordecai understands the providence of God somehow. He, he recognizes that God has placed Esther in this position for this particular time. In a position where she can make a difference. And, he, and she's worried. She's fearful about, about actually standing up and making a difference. And Mordecai says, look, if, <laughs> one way or the other, you're in this mess. And then, folks, I want to speak to you as the church of Jesus Christ this morning. One way or the other, you better figure it out. You are in this mess. It's not going to change. It's not getting any different. It's not getting any better. If you are waiting for evil to get better in its schemes, you are deceived. And so it's time to either stand up and be counted and speak on behalf of God or know this, you will be swept away in the evil that's coming. And that's in essence what Mordecai says. And he says, maybe it is that you have been positioned in this place for such a time as this. So I want to ask you this morning, Church of Jesus Christ, is it time for you and I to begin to recognize that even though we hate what we're seeing even though we're disgusted by what's taking place all around us, even though we're, we're angry, we're sad, we're frustrated about all that is happening in our society that we love, in our country that we've come to love and know since children, I understand that, but, but is it time to get past those feelings and begin to recognize that God himself still has a restrainer on the earth? There will always be a testimony on the earth, a people that will stand up and not be afraid and speak on behalf of God. There will always be. There always has been throughout human history. And so there's nothing that would suggest to you and I that we shouldn't. I want you to realize this morning that, that, that Mordecai begins to bring to the attention of Esther, you have access to the king. You have access to the king. 
And this morning, do you not know today that the word of God reveals to each and every one of you that are born again by the Holy Spirit that you have access to the king? Why on God's earth are we cowering back, afraid, timid, fearful, being led by emotion? Why are we not going into the throne room of God seeking help and strength and boldness and power in a time of need? We have access to the king. So the scripture says, the scripture says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Everything you have need of will be provided. And, and, and Mordecai is, is, is trying to reveal this to Esther and show her. And I think today the Lord would want us to see the same thing. While evil is planning and scheming to destroy all that is good. And folks, it's happening now. I, I, I read a story this week. I remember, I'm just going to say it. I remember many years ago as just a younger Christian that the homosexual agenda, and, and if I offend you, I apologize, I, but I've got to speak the truth. I just have to speak the truth, amen? And so many years ago, there was a homosexual agenda, and, and the agenda was quite simply this. We, we just want the same rights as everyone else. We, we don't want to be marginalized. We don't want to be discriminated against, and we just want to be treated like people. And, and you know, in many ways, that appeal was not that radical, was it? You may not like that lifestyle, and you may not agree with it, and you may know that it's contrary to the word of God, but, but as a Christian, there is no reason for you and I to treat someone evil, to treat someone wrong, to, to marginalize them, to harm them in any way. Would you agree? But, but where we made a mistake is we thought that it was going to end there. You see, it hasn't ended there. Because, because it became more and more mainstream. And now when we turn our televisions on with our children watching, we're watching homosexual acts on television. And not only are we seeing homosexual acts on regular television, our Supreme Court passed a law that says homosexuals can now marry. And, and we didn't, no, one, no one stood up. No one said, no, this is enough. We're not going any further. And today, as we sit here, there is a push be, be, behind the LGBTQ community that is demanding that tax-exempt status and other privileges be stripped from schools, universities that are Christian-based universities and that do not bend to the, the, the whim of the LGBT community. You see, evil just doesn't end. It doesn't stop. And if, you, if, if this is allowed, and God forbid that it is, and I, I, I have no... I have nothing inside of me that sees a restraining force out of our government. I see no restraining force from politicians. I, I see no resolve from anyone in secular society that's going to be willing to stand up and say, no, we're not going to do this. No, no, they're, they're going to bow, folks. And I, I feel like the church is coming to a place just like it was in the book of Daniel. This, this idol thing has been revealed. It, it's, been, it's been formed. It has been placed at the town square. And when the music plays, you and I are expected to bow. But I'm here to tell you that there will be a people that stand strong in the power of God and the power of Christ, full of the Holy Spirit. And just as Daniel did thousands of years ago, they will refuse to bend their knee and they will refuse to bow and they will stand as the restraining force against evil. You see, it was the same thing in Esther's day. There was an evil plan. Haman had everything he needed. He had everything he could ever want. He was wealthy. He was second in charge. But, but it wasn't enough for him because he was a greedy man. He was an evil man. And evil never subsides. It never stops, folks. And, and so for those of you that are parents and say, oh, the old theory, well, I don't want to push my kids too far away, so I'm never going to talk about Jesus in the home. How has it worked for you? It hasn't worked. It's time for you to recognize it. Don't condemn yourself. Don't beat yourself up. But identify it, recognize it, and begin to repent and change course. And realize that by, by kowtowing to your children, somehow believing that if you don't talk about the things of God, or if you don't make them come to church, or if you don't speak to them about evil and sin, and that somehow they're just going to openly come running to Jesus and running to the house of God. It hasn't happened, nor is it going to happen. As a parent, 
you are a restraining force in your home. You have been called by God himself to stand in your home as a voice for God as to what is right and what is wrong. And if your children like it or if they don't like it, it's not in your hands. Your, your job and your calling is to stand as a bulwark of defense again, again for what is right and for what is true. My question to you is, if you don't do it, who is going to? Who's going to? We're just going to allow evil to run rampant in the earth? No one's willing to stand up and be courageous any longer? No, we've been granted access to the king. And what I love about the story of Esther as you read it, and we're going to move on, is that, is that Esther recognizes that she has a position. She's been put in a position by God, not only to protect herself and her family, but also her people. And so the question has to be asked is, are we even concerned about our own countrymen anymore? Do we really care about our nation? Or do we just want the rights and the privileges that we've become so accustomed to having. Because the reality is, we're not just losing our freedoms and our liberties, folks. We're watching our society literally die and go to hell. And Esther wasn't willing. For, see, Mordecai, or, or uh, Haman's plan was not just to kill Mordecai. He wanted to kill all Jews. And, and so when she is granted access to the king, and she goes before the king, and as the story goes... She doesn't just ask for her life and, and for Hammond's life. She could have done that. You do know that, right, in the story. She could have just said, look, I'm a Jew, a Jewish. You didn't know it. My, my cousin, Mordecai, he's a Jew. He's like, here's what I'm asking you. Protect me, protect my family, keep us safe, and, you know, whatever else is happens, it happens. But, but she wasn't willing to do that. And my question is, is the church willing to just sit back idly while people go to hell? Lost and confused, bound in darkness with no understanding of truth, no understanding of light. God help us if that's our call. If that's the, if that's the reality of what the church of Jesus Christ has become. But I'm preaching to you, as for this church, and as for us, that's not our calling. I want you to go to Isaiah 59 as we get ready to close. Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59 verse 19 says this, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. And as for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants, the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord from this time and forevermore, 60, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and the Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings the brightness of your rising. You know, I've quoted that verse in Isaiah 59 multiple times, as you probably have. Oh, God, raise a standard against the enemy. Raise a standard against the enemy. I've prayed that, and I've prayed it. And here's the reality is, if you really study this passage of Scripture, I, I, do you know what you're praying when you ask God to raise a standard against the enemy? You're praying that God would raise you up. Because the reality is the standard, in, in literal terms, the standard was a flag. It was, it was a flag that, that gave the warriors on the battlefield an understanding of what was happening and what was going on, and it, it gave them bearings, if you will. Where do I go to find safety? Where do I go if I need a, a respite? Where do I go if, if I need a, a moment to just back up a second and refresh? Where, what is it? And there would be a, a giant flag, and it was a standard, and there would be a standard bearer, and he'd be holding the flag, and he'd be saying, it's here, I'm, we're here, everything's good. If that flag went down, the, the, the people on the battlefield knew it was over. It was time to retreat. Everything was gone. It was, we were losing, and it was time to take off and retreat. And that's what it means in literal terms. But the standard that I believe is being spoken of here, it's a prophecy. It's a word of prophetic utterance. And it's, it speaks really of you and me. That, that in the last days, while what we were reading in 1 Thessalonians is beginning to happen, God is going to raise up a people. He's going to raise up a church. He's going to raise up men and women 
Old men, old women, young men, young women, children of all ages, and he's going to come by his power. Does the word of God in the book of Joel not say that in the last days, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon young men and old women, old men, young women, old women. He says, my spirit shall come upon you, and you will stand and you will speak the word of God. And folks, that's where we're living today. The, the standard that's being spoken of in Isaiah 59, it's the church of Jesus Christ. It's the people of God. You and I today are the modern day Esther. We are the modern day Esther living in America. Watching as evil is rising and its tides are rising on every corner of the earth. And the question is, is who's going to be willing to walk boldly in to the king's throne and say, God, I need help, I need resources, I need boldness, I need courage, I need faith. I need your word to rise in my heart again so I can go into my home, go into my community, go into my workplace and stand as a standard bearer in the earth. He says, no, that's going to be my people. As evil rises like a flood, God says, I will have a standard in the earth. You see, God's not going to allow evil to just go unrestrained until he takes the church to heaven with him. Do you understand that? Until the seven-year tribulation period, there will always, always, always be a testimony on the earth. There will always be a people of courage on the earth. There will always be a people who are not willing to bow who are not, they're willing to burn rather than bow. They're willing to stand rooted and steadfast in the word of God. They may be ostracized, they may be marginalized, picked on, called foolish, whatever the world may throw at them, but they're willing to stand boldly in trust and faith in what God has declared. There'll always be a people on the earth. There always has been. I'm reading a commentary of an amazing man of God known as Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor during the time when Hitler took reign in Germany. You know the story. Hitler is just go, is unleashing now. He's, he's just, he, he turns into a madman, a vile. He's a modern day Hammond. And, and, and Diedrich Bonhoeffer was put in a position that many pastors were put in in that time. And, and many pastors, what, what we would consider maybe they were more orthodox, but maybe leaning toward evangelical-type pastors. I'm not talking about Catholics. That, that basically they bent their knee to Hitler because they recognized that if they stood against Hitler, it was going to cost them their lives, it was going to cost their families their lives, or it was going to cost them something. Let's put it that way. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer was not willing to bow. He was not willing to bend his knee. And he stood boldly in pulpits throughout Germany, and he would declare the truth of God's word. And he would speak against all the vileness that was taking place from the, from the Hitler regime. It ultimately cost him his life. My question is, where is the Diedrich Bonhoeffers of our day? Men and women that are just willing to stay and say, no, we're not doing this. We're not going to sit by idly and wait. We're, we're not. We're going to pray. We're going to fast. We're going to seek God. We're going to speak against this. Folks, it's time. It's time to speak boldly against socialism. It's time to speak boldly against an ungodly government agenda that would try to tell you and dictate how you raise your children, how you live, how you walk. It is time for the church of Jesus Christ to rise and speak God's truth in this hour. Give God praise. There will be a people, God says, that I will raise as a standard. I will raise them up. I will put my spirit upon them. I will put my words in their mouth. That's what the 21st verse says. And not only will my words be in their mouth, but they'll be in their children's mouths and their children's children's mouth. There's a promise here from God for those who are willing to be courageous and bold in this hour. He said, not only will you be courageous, but I'll cause your children to rise up and your children's children. There'll be a people that have devoted themselves to me and as the psalmist declared, I have hid your words in my heart that I might not sin against God. There will be a people in this day that will love God's word above the word of men. They will be more concerned about obeying the word of God than the word of men. There will be a fear, a genuine fear in the heart about somehow disobeying what God's word speaks. No matter what it costs them. It may cost my job, it may cost my social status, 
It may cost uh, our tax-exempt status, but we will stand and declare the word of God because we fear God more than we fear men. We will declare the word of God. And God says, upon this people, my glory will rise upon them. You look at chapter 60, the first verse. It says, and the glory of the Lord is going to rise upon them. The word, the word glory, it means this. It, 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 it's a profound word. It means weightiness. It, it means the weight of God, the splendor of God, the power of God, the authority of God. Do you see this? This is the promise for those that are willing to stake a, take a courageous stand. He said, I don't expect you to do it in your own strength. I don't expect you to do it in your own ability. I don't expect you to go scouring through the latest conservative blog and just, and just rehash what someone else has already blogged or put online. No, he says, get, turn the garbage off. Get rid of the foolishness. Lock yourself into my word. Let your word be hidden in your heart. And I will cause the Spirit of God to come upon you. And when you speak, you will speak with weightiness. Now, you're not going to just, listen, I'm, folks, it's time to just quit rehashing what every conservative blogger is speaking now. It's doing nothing. There's no weightiness in it. But when you and I begin to speak God's word, he promises, I'll give you weight. I'll give, you're, there'll be a substance behind it. There'll be a power behind it. Do you understand? We're not talking about just repeating what a certain news agency said or what, whatever. It's, in fact, it's time to get that garbage off. No more foolishness. No, if you and I want the glory of God to be upon us, then we have to devote ourselves fully to God and his word. Those who align themselves with God and seek him and desire for God to raise them up, they will make a difference in the world. My heart and prayer is today that it would be this church, that it would be you and it would be me. And that we would be called in our day to be standard bearers. Modern day Esthers. Not afraid. Because we've been with God. And we have a word for our society. Let's stand. Joe, if you'll come. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that those who have heard me today will see it the way I see it, as you've shown it to me, I mean, not, not my opinion, but Lord, I just see this. It's, it's more than a sermon. It's, I see you raising a people up. I, I see you with a spiritual eye, and your glory is resting upon humble men, humble women who are just willing to surrender themselves to you and not bend their knee to evil any longer. Not worry about their reputation, not worry about what others might think, but worry only about what you think and what you say. And I see, I see the Holy Spirit resting upon us and empowering us and using us as restrainers and, and speaking to those that are lost in darkness and bringing light and bringing hope to those that are searching. They're, they're, they are, they're searching. They need someone that will stand up and be an armor bearer or a standard bearer. They'll be a restraining force. Someone that can stand as Paul did in the New Testament. He had been with God and he came out of the belly of a ship and he said, I've been with God and I have a word. Lord, may that be the church of Jesus Christ. May that be this church. May that be me. May that be us. Lord, have your way. This morning, let's just take a minute and let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts.